In this segment, we're going to look at cylinder replacement. We're going to walk through that and, and talk through that with this engine that's on an overhaul stand. It's much easier to do it on an overhaul stand than it is to do it on the airplane. And so for that reason, I almost wish we had an airplane sitting here with it on. But um, since this is what we have, this is, uh, this is what we'll, we'll go through doing it. It's not necessary to have the propeller off in order to do this. Uh, but we don't have a propeller on this, and so we'll, we'll do it without the propeller. It also makes it easier to see uh, what we're doing. And um, we'll, we'll look at the things on the front side of the engine first, then we'll go around back and, um, and do the things on the rear. And the instructions that we'll be giving here will be the same whether you're doing one cylinder or, or all seven cylinders. So this, this information would also be good for a, um, a top overhaul of the engine. You'd just be doing seven rather than one. Um, the first thing that, uh, that we want to do in, uh, in preparing to remove a cylinder is we want to make sure that whatever cylinder we're working on, the piston is at top dead center in that cylinder. Now the reason for that is, it, let's just say that, that we're going to remove the number two cylinder. We want to make sure that the piston has traveled all the way to the top of its travel and it's at top dead center. Doesn't matter if it's at top dead center on the compression stroke or not, not for this reason, we just need to have it at top dead center because when we pull the cylinder off, we don't want the piston to be down here inside the case, which when it's at bottom dead center, it actually is inside the case uh, by a couple of inches. We want it up here at the top so that th when the rings come out, the rings don't come out inside the case because then it gets complicated uh, getting the, the piston out of there without breaking something. So we want to make sure that the, that the piston is at top dead center when we uh, begin to remove that cylinder. Now how do we do that? The crankshaft has a blind spline, and um, the, by blind spline, we mean that that spline is the one that is always pointing towards the piston that is at top dead center. So right now, this spline and this, this pin that's in here, which is actually a screw on a Continental engine, is, is pointing at the number one cylinder. Number one cylinder is the one that's at the very top. And so we know when that, that pin, that, um, that blind spline is pointing to number one, number one piston is at top dead center. Now if we rotate that around, a few degrees, it'll be pointed at number two, and we'll know that number two is now at top dead center. Number one will no longer be at top dead center. So let's zoom in on that pin so that you can see what that looks like. Now you can see our blind spline better here. It actually is a little screw. Now because it's a screw, it's possible to remove that screw. If you do that, you'll no longer have a good way to index the propeller and you won't really know where you're at. So it's important to have that screw in there. Then when the propeller goes on, it, the blind spline on the, uh, on the propeller hub will be indexed with that, uh, that little screw and that little screw will always point towards the, um, the piston that is at top dead center. All right, now that we've located our blind spline, what we want to do is put the, uh, the crankshaft turning bar on. The crankshaft turning bar also has a blind spline here and so that that will match up with this one and as a result this bar will always be pointing towards the piston that is at top dead center. That's the same way with the blade on your crankshaft. Depending on how your, uh, your propeller hub is indexed, you will have either a blade or 90, degree, 90 degrees to a blade that will always be indexed towards the, uh, the piston that's at top dead center. And you'll have to determine uh, which you have. But we've got this, uh, this indexed now uh, with the blind spline. We know that this um, is at top dead center. And um, uh, doesn't matter whether it's a compression stroke or not. So if, if we wanted to go to top dead center on number two, we just bring it around like this. Top dead center on number three, we know that the piston is, is following the blind spline all the way around. Okay, so let's, we, were, we were going to, um, to go through a replacement of cylinder number two. So we'll, we'll set up our, um, our crankshaft turning bar so the blind spline 
and the crankshaft turning bar are pointed at number two. We know that, uh, that the piston is now at top dead center, so we can take this off and get it out of our way. All right. Um, we would need to pull this, all the spark plugs out. Makes it a lot easier to turn this thing through if the spark plugs aren't in. Um, and we'll begin by removing all the pal nuts all the way around on the front side. Now this is uh, you can use that little pal nut removal tool, or if you don't um, if you don't have that tool, then uh, these are fairly easy to get in, get with a, a 9 16th box in wrench. So take those off. Remove your cylinder base nuts with the cylinder base nut. Uh, removal wrench. Um, if you have, uh, well, depending on what kind of exhaust that you have on your on your engine, whether it's a, um, a Waco style exhaust or a Stearman style exhaust, you, with the Waco style exhaust, you'll remove less exhaust uh, because it's a dual outlet out the bottom, and the Stearman exhaust is a single outlet out the side. So you'll have to remove at least the exhaust segment that goes to the cylinder that you're getting ready to replace. And you'll have to loosen the exhaust uh, on the adjacent cylinder so you can get this, this piece of exhaust completely out of there. So once you've got the, uh, uh, the cylinder base nuts off, the uh, exhaust pulled, you can remove the rocker covers, uh, unlock the, um, the valve adjust lock nut uh, with, the, uh, with the lock nut wrench that we showed earlier, uh, take the, um, the uh, lock nut adjusters out, remove them, then you can use a, a magnet to grab your push rods and pull the push rods out through the rocker arm. There's no real reason to remove the rocker arms at this stage. You can leave the rocker arms in. Uh, if you're going to have to take the rocker arms out, it's much easier to do that on the bench uh, than it is on the engine. So, um, so just go ahead and, and get the push rods out and, and that's everything on the front side of the engine that we have to do. Now we'll move around to the back. All right, we're around on the back side of the engine now, and uh, we're continuing with our, um, our removal of cylinder number two. We probably should say before we go on that uh, that cylinder number one is is a very special situation because number one carries the master rod inside of it. So if we are removing cylinder number one, it's very, very important that once we remove it, that that master rod is never moved from the center of the um, of the the case hole there, and we should if we remove uh, number one, you never turn the crankshaft until number one is back on again. Now it's very very important that that happen or that that not happen, because with with all the other cylinders except number one, uh, we we pull number two off. We can move the piston and link rod side to side. Nothing bad happens. If we remove number one and move the piston and master rod side to side, what happens is all the other link rods move when that master rod moves. And what will happen is the, the pistons that are near or at bottom dead center will actually move farther into the case. The oil control ring or the oil scraper ring will spring out of the bottom of the cylinder. Now what happens is if we move the crankshaft any farther, that piston tries to go up in there with the ring sprung out and either the ring or the piston will be broken or both. And so it's very important once number one is removed that nothing is turned until number one is back on again. So if you're doing a complete top overhaul, number one is the last cylinder to come off. All the others come off first, then number one comes off. It's also the first cylinder to go back on because it, it holds the master rod stationary again so you can put all the others on without danger of, uh, of popping rings out the bottom of the cylinder skirt. So number one is always the, the last to come off and the first to go back on again. All right, continuing on with, um, uh, with number two here, uh, we would need to remove the primer line and the clamps. Um, we would need to, uh, to clear the intake pipe so that it can come off. Now the intake pipe originally had three studs and you would need to remove the nuts off all three of these studs or at least loosen them to get the cylinder off. Uh, some people have replaced the top most uh, stud with a bolt 
and if you replace the topmost stud with a bolt, you can take the intake pipe completely off of the of this cylinder without removing the cylinder. Otherwise, if the, the original stud is still in there, then the intake pipe has to stay on and come off with the cylinder. All right, uh, so assuming that we've got, we've got the, uh, the three nuts loose at the top, then we need to take the intake pipe gland nut loose at the bottom. And for that, we'll use our intake pipe gland nut wrench that we talked about earlier, it has a loop, and we're just using a long awl through that in order to, uh, to turn it. So we would get that down in there, get it on the, um, the intake pipe gland nut wrench, and, and remove that. Once the, the nut is loose, these are loose, then we can go in and remove the, uh, the pushrod tubes. Now with the pushrod tubes, at the top, they're held by this retaining nut um, and this gland. And that's where we use our pushrod tube nuts, that we, or wrenches that we talked about earlier. This one uh, secures the retainer and this one will loosen the, the nut that holds the packing. So we can, we can loosen those, um, remove the, the packing nut, move it down, remove the retainer, and move it down. Then down at the base where the uh, pushrod tube joins the case, we have two um, quarter inch uh, nuts down there on studs. Once we remove those, then these are slid down. We can take the intake or the pushrod tubes completely out. So the pushrod tubes will now be removed. We can reach down and get to the remainder of the rear cylinder base nuts. Have to take off our, our pal nuts with our little pal nut removal tool. And on the back side is where that tool really shines because it's difficult to get an open in um, 9 16 wrench in there to take those pal nuts off. But if you have that little uh, removal tool with the uh, uh, T-handle, you can get those, uh, those pal nuts off. Then go in with the cylinder base nut, uh, wrench, take all your, your cylinder base nuts loose. And at this point, you really need to have a friend to help because as we extract the cylinder, the cylinder is ready to come off now. As we pull the cylinder off, uh, we've got the piston at top dead center, and so we can pull the cylinder probably about six inches before the piston is exposed. And we've got a link rod that's hanging out here with a piston on it. What we don't want to do is extract that cylinder. The weight of the piston and link rod would swing down. The uh, link rod would hit the case, damaging the case and possibly damaging the link rod. So, uh, so we want to be careful that as we remove this cylinder, we have a friend who is there to catch the piston and link rod as we extract the cylinder so that it doesn't fall down. Gravity will, will be working against you here. And what you can do is take a rag, fold the rag up, and lay it between the case and the link rod so that when the link rod comes down, it rests against that rag and, um, and doesn't ding either the link rod or the case. Once we've got the cylinder removed, we can take it over, um, use our uh, valve spring compressor to remove the, um, the valves and, uh, and do whatever repair needs to be done to the cylinder. Then after that's done and we're ready to put it back on again, you'll be faced with uh, deciding whether to reuse your piston and rings or whether to replace the piston and rings. Um, you can measure the, uh, uh, the piston pin hole in the, um, in the piston to determine whether the clearances are still good there. Probably the thing that we see most often with the pistons is the top ring groove being worn out. Uh, the top ring takes most of the, of the pressure of the combustion event and so that ring works in the, uh, in the ring groove and wears the piston and where's the ring. So that's probably the, the, um, you know, the greatest cause for rejection of a piston is the, uh, the worn top ring groove. And you can check that with a, uh, with a feeler gauge and um, the dimensions are, are in the overhaul manual as far as the, uh, uh, the manufacturer's minimum and the service limit so that you can determine whether or not that, uh, that piston is still serviceable. Now, if, if you find that your, um, that your top ring groove is worn out, you're faced with a couple different options. One is to replace the piston. 
new pistons are available now and so you could put a, a new piston in there you could put a serviceable piston in that um, uh, that has uh, good uh, top ring groove clearances another option if you can find the over width ring continental made a plus eight over width ring so that the top ring groove could be machined once it was worn and that piston could be saved unfortunately uh, there aren't very many of those rings around. They're getting pretty tough to find. Um, but it was eight thousandths over width. Now, what has happened in, in the last few years is that uh, a few enterprising folks have gone out and manufactured a plus ten width ring. And um, all of those rings that I have seen had problems. Uh, the ring wall tension was too great so that the ring was actually pushing on the cylinder wall um, with a greater tension than the, the original uh, and a greater tension than what the cylinder was designed for. And in a very short time, those, uh, those new manufacture uh, plus 10 width rings have worn the pistons out, worn the, uh, the cylinders out so that sometimes with less than 100 hours on a, uh, on a cylinder replacement, uh, the, uh, the cylinder is worn to the place that um, uh, it, it looks like a thousand hour cylinder. So um, I would not recommend using that, um, that plus 10 width uh, ring. But if you can find the plus 8 width ring, uh, they worked great. Or you can uh, put a serviceable piston or a new piston in um, if, your, uh, if your original piston uh, top ring groove is, is worn out. Now the, um, the uh, replacement of the cylinder is really the opposite of the disassembly. Uh, one of the handy little tools that, um, that we found to use to uh, compress the rings is the, um, the KD wrinkle band ring compressor. And I'll walk over and get one of those for you so that you can see what that looks like. This is the, um, is the KD wrinkle band ring compressor. It's, uh, it's fully adjustable up to a five and a half inch uh, bore. And the nice thing about this little ring compressor is that it breaks in the middle. Unlike some of the ring compressors that are, are solid, and uh, once you've compressed the ring, uh, there's not a good way to get it off. Um, these things break in the middle, and uh, it has a cam over action so that, uh, that once, you, uh, once you compress the ring, and uh, you'll, on the Continental, you'll be compressing the uh, two top compression rings and the oil control ring at one time. You slip the cylinder over those, then you open up the wrinkle band, slip it down, put it on the um, oil scraper ring, recompress it, continue to push the cylinder on until the cylinder pushes the uh, wrinkle band off, then you can undo the wrinkle band again, take it off, and continue down with your, um, with your cylinder. And that about covers the, um, uh, the removal and reinstallation of a cylinder on a W670 Continental.